testing. Hello, hello, hello. Yeah, so this talk, just to kind of lightly introduce it, is a kind of a two series talk. So the first part of this talk is uh, a few years ago my modem gets hacked and the second part of this talk is like actually going and hacking the ISP. So there's like a bit of a break in the mid part of it. But yeah, as people kind of filter in just a little bit, we'll go ahead and kick it off. We still have three minutes, so we're a little early. <laughs> What's the deal with airline food? <laughs> yeah, so Southwest is doing assigned seating now, which is kind of, I don't know, how do you guys feel about that? <laughs> cool, so I think most people kind of came in, so we'll go ahead and just kick it off. So it's like a really quick who am I? Uh, my background is just like really heavy in like web security. It's like my one thing I'm like really, really serious, like love about. So all my passion like last like six years is just like nonstop like bug bounty consulting and like kind of web sec research. One thing I'm really proud of is like the port swigger top 10 web hacking techniques. We've kind of hit that like every year for some sort of research. Uh, but yeah, some kind of thanks here at the bottom just to a lot of people who have over the last few years like really helped with running like blog posts, doing like really good research and just kind of helping with any questions. Uh, specifically, yeah, Justin Reinhardt, Alden, Philip, Brett, Ian, Nathaniel, Mike, Shubbs, Joel, and William. Thank you. Woo! Yeah, so our story begins in 2022. And in 2022, I was on a pen test and I was kind of working for my home network. And when I was working on this pen test, I had to spin up a box like on AWS to log requests for an HTTP server for an XXE vulnerability. So when I was doing it, I sent like a test request for my home network to see if that web server was live. And when I sent hello, everything worked expectedly. There was, you know, git slash hello in the log file and everything was good to go. But just a few minutes later after I tapped back into the screen, I saw this really, really weird IP address that had replayed the exact same HTTP request that I'd sent. And this was kind of freaky to me because I just spun up this AWS account and it probably meant my computer had been hacked. But like in order to actually research it, I kind of pulled up other devices on my network. So I loaded it from my phone, my laptop, even the smart TV and my like guest bedroom and then the uh, everything was like resending the exact same HTTP request. So my network had been compromised somewhere along the kind of flow and I assumed it was my modem because you know that's like the easiest thing to pop but I really didn't know at the time so I was just really curious. So part one of this is just really quick, who hacked my modem, right? And the IP resolves to like this weird DigitalOcean IP and the reason I say it's weird is because if you look at the history of the IP, there's all these like really weird ops that it does, right? So there's like these phishing domains and like this really weird domain format they've done. So at one point in time, the IP address pinged back to all these different domains as like a host provider. So for me, it's weird because it's like, you know, if you hack me, you're going to run like C2 from that IP. But these domains are like websites with like, you know, uh, beef and like, hook.js, right? And like, so they're doing like targeted phishing campaigns against these websites. And it was really weird. And one of the websites uh, was, I'll go forward I think a little bit. Oh, maybe I deleted the slide, but ISG Latam, right? And ISG Latam is like this South American cybersecurity company. So it's really weird that like this IP address was like also hacking this South American cybersecurity company. So I was like super intrigued, right? Because like, you know, if, if one person pops you to like hit somebody offline on like a botnet or something, it's like, oh, that's cool. But like, who is like hacking South American cybersecurity companies but also like random modems? I was really curious. And something that uh, a few friends, Philip and Alden and Justin helped me with later on is like we looked into it and we realized that like at one point in time this really weird uh, DGA or like domain generation algorithm domains were pointed at the IP address. So they had like this really weird format and there was like thousands of these domains that somebody had bought and like rotated for this malware. So whoever had hacked the modem was like doing this really sophisticated thing but also like doing like normal human ops where they're like running phishing sites. And this is all just kind of from like historical uh, history of that IP address. So it was like, okay, very, very strange. So <laughs> I, I tried some tricks with this, right? I kind of thought like, okay, if this person has like planted malware on my device and like there's somewhere in between, maybe we could like command inject the curl request that they're sending. Because it's really weird, right? Like if you're passively monitoring someone's traffic, it's like, that's one thing, but like replaying the HTTP request is really bizarre, right? Like the only thing I think is like if they've like built a SaaS dashboard for like their hacked devices and they're like taking screenshots or something, I don't know. It was really weird, but no luck here. Like we couldn't figure out any redirect or like finding some way to control that malicious IP address. 
Yeah, so Cox Communications is the name of ISP. And we uh, took the device, I took it back to the store and I was like, hey, you know, like, I think my device is hacked, I want to keep it, but I want to get like a second modem. And they're like, yeah, you actually rent that device, you have to give it to us. So the dude just took it and I was really sad because like at that point in time like there's nothing you can really do, you know, like the actual compromised device is gone. So really sadly, you know, two years later, no device but I was helping a buddy move and this little guy is me on the phone and uh, my buddy, he was setting up his modem at like a new house, right? And I called the tech support and I'm like, yo, you know, like we need to get this new device hooked on fiber, how does that work, like can you do it for me? And the dude on the phone is just like, yeah, you know, like we can hook you up to fiber and like do everything remotely. And I was like, whoa, that's like really interesting. You can manage like more than just like Wi-Fi password or whatever. And I looked into a little bit of like how the ISP tech support actually does it. And there's this protocol that like a lot of people are probably familiar with called TR69 or TR069. And this protocol is like super researched. There's actually a few really cool DEF CON talks about it where people have actually popped the protocol itself. But the thing that's really interesting to me is that like this protocol isn't accessible from the internet, right? And I wasn't externally exposing this protocol, so like I probably wasn't hacked like this. However, there exists this really cool like API or some sort of functionality between the call center and the ACS. So if you're like a tech support person, there's probably some like internal API that they've built to like manage a device. And I was really curious like what, what exists there and like can we look into it? So this kind of kicks off part two, right? The hacking millions of modems. And to begin, I, I kind of had a thought here where it's like, okay, if I wanted to like hack my modem and I wanted to do it through this like weird like process of going through the ISP because in, you know in that way like you've got like so much more exposed and there's such a rich attack surface where like if you pop the support agent, I was like, well, the business portal is like the second best thing to the actual tech support portal that they're using. If you have like a residential customer account, it's like okay, you can like reset your device and it's pretty boring, right? Like. But the business side of things, it's like manage VLAN, manage security group, manage everything, right? So I kind of looked into it and I didn't have an account. So I was just like pilfering the JavaScript like a beggar, you know? I was grabbing all these endpoints. And uh, there's this whole like API CBMA format. So like every single API call for the Cox business site was prefixed with this like a API CBMA. And I thought this was really cool because like I did a lot of research on like, you know, reverse proxies and stuff and like, API CBMA was behaving like so much differently than like any other request on the site. So I thought like, you know, there's a chance that that's some like internal API that we can kind of dig into. So I started playing with it a bit and you can kind of see the format of this request here. If it's too small, it's basically just like a registration request. And with this request, there's a few headers, API key, client ID, and then just like the path itself, right? And it works really good. But one thing I was curious is like where are these endpoints actually at, right? So the really easy thing to do is just like look for like actuators or swagger files. And I was really stoked because like I couldn't find actuators but I did find the swagger UI. But something kind of annoying for us, very sad face, right, is like the JavaScript and like every static resource on that page wasn't loading. And the reason this was happening is because the static resources, even though the API CBMA route was like proxying to that internal API, anything like .js, .css, .html, was being normally sent to the front end web server as it was like a static resource. So in order to actually like load the resources from that back end server, if we just chucked in a percent %2f or like a slash at the end of it, it would actually still carry that request to that reverse proxy. And this is really fun for us because now it's just like happy face, right? We can load the swagger. Um, these reverse proxies are like super, super interesting and like a really good point of research I think. But to kind of continue on a little bit, this swagger file had like 700 different routes, right? So to kind of go through each of these is like really interesting but there's a few that were like really, really cool to me, right? Like data internet gateway and like account equipment, right? Because even though like the, the site itself was just for like business management, it still seemed to have like a lot more functionality than like what needed to be exposed for that. So I assume maybe there's like some extra stuff here. So the easiest thing for us or for me to do here is just like chuck in an intruder and like try to send a get request or like post request or whatever to these endpoints. and. Uh, I realized that very like kind of oddly there's this pattern, right? And this pattern is strange because like instead of like categories of API endpoints like being unauthenticated or authenticated, it was just like a percentage of them, you know, and like there's no nothing discernible about like which API endpoints were or weren't authenticated. And it, it was around like 50% gave you an authorization error, 35% bad request, and like 15% were success. And it's like okay, you know, like 
kind of strange as there's no pattern for like what is or isn't authenticated. So I kind of, I continued around a little bit and what I found was this endpoint that had originally returned 200, if I just kept sending it over and over again, it would give me like different authorization errors. So my immediate thought is like, okay, there's like a weird load balancer here and like the authorization just seems like proper broken, right? So profile search, it looked like it took a parameter via the URI, so I went ahead and just like chucked in like a funny test string and I just wrote like FBI. And uh, the results, it's uh, like, it gave me just like 30 FBI field offices. <laughs> and it was cool too, cause uh, yeah, like it had the address, so I could just Google and be like, oh, like that's like a proper, you know, customer. And at this point it's like, all right, we're gonna start drafting the report, but we, you know, you Google a bit and you find the building, right? And for us it's cool, it's like, okay, like, clearly this API is a little broken, right? And you can access like some customer records, but like, the thing that was really interesting for us and the thing I was curious is like, how do we access like device stuff, right? So I went back to that API and I found this really, really simple HTTP request in the API docs and it took a parameter called MAC address. So I went to the back of my modem and I took my MAC address from it and I just threw in this API and it returned my, I, my current IPv4 address. And this is really, really, really cool for us because as a res residential customer accessing through like the business API, I'm able to hit my own device, right? So it confirms that there's like this ecosystem and I'm like being ported internally and can like actually hit my device. So really cool for us, you know, and it made me want to keep digging a little bit, right? So the second thing I did is like, all right, how do I get someone else's MAC address? And there's this endpoint to retrieve like a user account via like email or you can just like search via like name or whatever. And it's going to return like the user ID of the account and then really simply you can just pull out the equipment on the account. So every single connected device, like iPhone, TV, whatever is connected to the internet, you could just pull here passively. There's no like triggers or like notifications to the account holder when you access this data. So it's really cool because it's just like, oh, you know, my neighbor has like a new TV or something. Very nice. But cool, like at this point, it's like, it's a pretty bad bug, but like, you know, it's just like PII and like there's some interesting things, but yeah, it's like how do we escalate this, right? There was a lot of like cool endpoints like voicemails, emails, uh, things like that. Like Cox is a pretty big like broadband provider and they do a bunch of different things. So the question I, we now have is like how do we actually update devices? So there's this parameter I kept saying called encrypted value, right? And encrypted value is kind of annoying because it's like as an unauthenticated user who can't actually use the app, it's like how do we figure out what this value is, right? And when we would query it, it would give this sort of sale error. And the sale error was kind of weird because it's like, I have no idea what sale is or kind of how it works. So I did some amazing OSINT and uh, found out someone on LinkedIn was really happy to share what sale was with us. And sale turns out to be what I think is just like the internal Cox communications, like device communication stuff, right? So, you know, if you built like a new website, you use and leverage this like sale protocol internally and then that's how you kind of like talk to devices, right? Because if we go back to like TR69, there's basically like a point of authentication like at the two device communication. So like if you wanted to make that simpler, you just build this like infrastructure that like leverages that and has the secrets. So sale itself was like this authenticated internal thing from the sounds of it as like an external person. So we kind of dug through the JavaScript and the JavaScript is really cool because it referenced this encrypted value a bunch and I kind of traced it a while and eventually found out that there was this function to like encrypt or decrypt a string but it was like this really weird kind of like runtime thing and we could have extracted it and ran it but I thought the easiest thing to do here is just to toss it, uh, find a point in the app where like it uses this function and do like a breakpoint. So there's this endpoint uh, to like register and there's a four digit pen and the four digit pen is like encrypted client side. So if you just like set a breakpoint here and then throw it in the console, you can actually just like go ahead and encrypt or decrypt the values. So here's like an example string, right? Now this string's cool because like it shows kind of the whole format of how it works and we just encrypted the value like 8042 and I pass it in to the endpoint for device management. And it was really, really cool because like the sale error it gave was like one for error, you know, we've decrypted it successfully but we really don't know what to do with it. Like it's now like a different error which means that like on the back end sale stuff they're using that same encryption which is huge because it's like now we can uh, hit those device endpoints, right? So I hit up a friend and they run like a small MSP in Omaha, Nebraska and they're like, hey, you know, I'm a Cox business customer, do you want to like sign my account? So I did and <laughs> happy to do that and you know, and pilfer a little bit and we found that there's like the, the actual like example parameter encrypted value. 
And when you decrypt that parameter, you get like this kind of string below. And actually deep dive that string, you have like the following values in the decrypted value. So you have like the account number, device ID, device name, and all this random stuff. But the thing that was really interesting to us is like there's this MAC address parameter, right? And I was kind of scared at this point because it's like, well, if I'm an attacker and I want to like pop somebody, I just want to do it like via MAC address. So like if there's any way to like just do it with only the MAC address, it'd be the easiest. So I just went ahead and like signed a bunch of data with uh, a MAC address and everything else being like junk data. And after I did that, it worked perfect, right? So we, we sent this request and this is my own Wi-Fi with an encrypted MAC address and I went in and sent it and it returned like this success error. And I was like, okay, what does that mean? So I like resent the request again but I realized like my whole network was offline. So <laughs> this update request like actually kind of like just took my, it, it updated my device configuration, took the device offline and rebooted it. And yeah, so like I was able to just update my thing here which is kind of like the boom where it's like you can actually push these configuration settings and like that underlying TR69 protocol you can do like whatever you want, right? You have the same permissions as like a support agent. So like updating Wi-Fi password, viewing connected devices, you know, basically like using a device as a proxy essentially, like opening ports, you know, anything you could normally do as a support agent you could do via this, right? So it's like GG for that. You could, I think the actual route if you want to get RCE via this is there's like a push, pushing a configuration or like a new package for the device. And it's, it's, it's interesting because it's like, you know, this kill chain, right, where it's like one, find someone's account ID, two, you know, get their MAC address, and like three, you can just like do a bunch of random hardware stuff that's really fun. But like now what, you know, like it's, it's kind of scary because what actually kicked off a lot of this research is uh, there's this really interesting like point of centralization for like all ISPs, right? So even if you use like Cox or a smaller ISP, there's a few like really big ISPs like Comcast and Comcast actually like develops a lot of software for all these different ISPs, right? So if you open your like, you know, Cox app, you think it's going through the servers, right? And the thing is like it actually talks to like Comcast to authenticate, right? So this one like single HP server, it's like dh.something.comcast.net has like hundreds of millions of devices behind like a single web server, right? So if somebody popped this, it's just bizarre because yeah, 10 petabytes of data a day or something like that, they're collecting just insane like whatever, you know, and like uh, with like FISA reauthorization or FISA, however you say it, um, I'm sorry, I'm not Edward Snowden or whatever, but the FISA, uh, it's kind of scary because like they're, it's just like an easy gateway to just like passively monitor like all this random metadata. Because I think like 10 years ago, you know, maybe they're not logging like the actual names of devices connected to your network, but like now it's just like a crazy amount of metadata that's being stored on like one system, right? And here's like, this is totally unreadable by the way, so I'm sorry about that. Um, this is just an HP request to Comcast, like when you actually authenticate to your app through the Cox app. So like, you know, Cox is just levering this for your authentication, so it just demonstrates like, hey, you pop like this one API, it's GG for hundreds of millions of devices. And yeah, kind of a shorter talk and I think the whole idea of this is just kind of go through like, this point is like very, very interesting where it's like, these single points of failure with like massive impact. And uh, just a really quick summary, like Cox was like super, super great to work with but they confirmed like, hey, you know, this uh, vulnerability you found isn't actually the one you got hacked by because we introduced it later in time, right? But the possibility there of like, you know, someone in hacking at like an ISP level, these like APIs built on TR69 is like really, really fascinating. And they did confirm too like that DigitalOcean IP is like not theirs at all. So like somebody did own the modem but it's like not via that. And uh, just like a really quick, you know, thank you for watching. There's a ton <laughs> oh, somebody said there'd be some bleed from the rooms, yeah. But uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm just so curious what, what's going on but uh, yeah, there's some really great like references for this and like I really, I'm really hopeful for like more research here in the future but there's a lot of the things that like people can find vulnerabilities in are like behind like a VDP with like a non-disclosure terms. So I think people have probably found like similar issues before and I'm really, really curious to see what kind of comes out of things like this. But yeah, here's a few links to the Cox stuff and I really, really appreciate you guys coming to this really short talk and uh, I hope it kind of shows some light on like this specific vector. Yeah, I think we, we probably have a bunch of time for like QA if anybody has anything in particular, but 
Um, are we going to do mics or just like? Oh, yeah, happy to yell. Feel free. Oh, working with Cox was great. Big fan. They were honestly like a really good team. Like, they did the thing where like every message they responded with was like legally verified. It felt like, like they copied and pasted it in a bunch of different formats. But really good team. They did. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Yeah. So honestly, like Python scripts and like Bash scripts and stuff. Like ChatGPT is so good for uh, random stuff like that. But yeah. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Yeah, so I haven't actually looked at like any of the other ONTs on the market, but like they're really fascinating. Like setting up that little fiber thing. Um, a lot of people I know who worked at ISPs, like you should definitely dig into that. It's like really messed up, but yeah, let me see if there's any. Oh, so Yeah, it's like really interesting because like this is like something that like grows and adds like oh sorry. Yeah, so Spectre's asked like if there's anything like uh any other vulnerabilities that exist in that ecosystem and I'm just like hundred percent, right? Like this is like an ecosystem that like grows and changes and like updates and stuff, so people are gonna find more stuff. But yeah, uh, sorry, could I a hermit? Yeah, working with ISPs and like telcos, I feel like for vulnerability disclosure is like they're very uh like more government legal feeling than like many other organizations. Because if you have like Silicon Valley, like Robin Hood, it's like pretty chill, you know? But like with them, it's like such a structured organization. It's like going to the 2000s America. Yeah, so it's, it was actually like a Comcast device, I think, is like the Cox Panoramic Wi Fi. But yeah. Oh, yeah, that's pretty good. All right. Yeah, so Sorry. adding the to customer data to the blockchain I think is a could help secure it, you know, like less uh, attack vectors. Yeah. So if uh you have a question, there's a microphone here so everybody in the audience can hear you. Oh yeah, Derek, if you want to uh, yeah. So did you ever figure out how they were mirroring your traffic? Yeah, I don't know. It's it's really interesting because like the the actual review process, like I never found the malware, like I turned in that copy of the device, but it's like Probably, uh, I'm, I'm, I don't even know. Just some like middle part they throw in there. But yeah, sorry. I'm sorry, but the schedule says you have 45 minutes, but you only presented 20. Did you cut anything? <laughs> yeah, so there was a lot of like, there's some revisions. Um, I worked really close with the team a bit with Cox and stuff. So some of the content was, uh, they didn't specifically ask that anything be removed, but like, it was an agreement for like certain content. Yeah, so definitely a shorter talk, but hopefully it's more chill than, you know, nobody falls asleep or something. Cheers. When, when you asked if you could keep your modem, did they look at you weird? Were they like, why would you want to keep this? That's insanity. Yeah, so like the, I think I used the word reverse engineer and they thought it was like a trade secret thing. Oh. Wow. Yeah, so they didn't really like that, yeah. Yeah, she just stole it. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Um, so I work with Spectrum actually. Oh, cool. So, um, one of the things I've noticed with us, and I think it's for similar reasons to this, is that we've stopped providing modems and routers that you can log into. Yep. That's completely out of the question you have to go through our website and we only give you a couple options like here's your password and whatever. Have you noticed that with many providers? Like seen that before? Yeah, hundred percent. So the the like internetization of like modems just feels like this weird byproduct of like everything moving. It's like, oh we're gonna do new features, like we're gonna add this security gateway and all this stuff. So yeah, it does it definitely feels like devices are moving towards like less management like locally on the network and like more management on the cloud which is like maybe more accessible to people but like it, yeah it does create that centralization problem. Was Ian also involved in this research? <laughs> <laughs> Ian Carroll did a lot of review for the slides. Very happy. Yeah. Cheers. And yeah thank you for coming and sorry if uh, you're expecting 45 minutes. Yeah yeah. Cheers.